Southern Fraud True Crime covers cases that are not suitable for young listeners, and there may also be some explicit language used. Listener discretion is advised. On June 18, 1995, a club called The Bayou was pretty busy for a Sunday night. 21-year-old Jennifer Evans was there with her friends, Andrea and Michelle. They were vacationing in Virginia Beach and had decided to go out dancing that night. After Jennifer and her friends got to the bar, she struck up a conversation with a Navy SEAL named Dusty Turner, who was with his close friend, Billy Brown, also a SEAL. Jennifer spent the rest of the night talking to Dusty and hanging out with her friends. When Andrea and Michelle wanted to leave at around 1 a.m., Jennifer said she wanted to keep talking to Dusty. So Andrea and Michelle went for coffee and a late night snack while Jennifer hung out with Dusty until closing time. They were supposed to meet her in the parking lot to pick her up at 2 a.m. But when Andrea and Michelle got back to the bayou, there was no sign of Jennifer. And they knew this wasn't like her. Jennifer was a careful girl who would never leave without telling her friends. The girls spent two hours searching for Jennifer, but they had no luck finding her. They went back to the beach house, hoping she was there, but she wasn't. When she still hadn't returned by the next morning, Andrea and Michelle reported her missing. They knew something terrible had happened to Jennifer, but nothing could have prepared them for the truth. Welcome to episode 159, The Murder of Jennifer Evans. Jennifer Leah Evans, who was described by many who knew her as beautiful and personable, was born on May 6, 1974 in Atlanta, Georgia. She was the only child of Al and Dolores, who called her every parent's dream. She had a knack for bringing people together and she was always there if you needed a friend. Jennifer attended Tucker High School, where she was a cheerleader. She had also been on the gymnastics team, but after having back surgery to treat scoliosis, Jennifer spent months in a body cast. When she recovered, she could no longer compete, so she started coaching gymnastics to young children. After graduating high school in 1992, Jennifer studied pre-med at Emory University in Atlanta on an academic scholarship. Her dream was to be a pediatrician. This career path made total sense for Jennifer, who was a natural with children. The Virginian pilot later reported that at Emory, Jennifer was on the dean's list with near-perfect grades and was one of the university's most promising students. When she wasn't studying, She volunteered in a children's hospital. She also loved to play sports and go dancing at clubs. Her favorite musical groups were Lord of Acid and TLC. In June 1995, 21-year-old Jennifer was staying with her parents while she was on summer break from school. For the first part of the month, Jennifer took care of both of her sick grandmothers. She bathed, fed, walked, and nursed Dolores's mother, who lived with Dolores and Al. Then a few times a month, Jennifer traveled to visit Al's mother, who was in the hospital. On June 17th, Jennifer flew to Virginia Beach for a week-long vacation with her two friends, Andrea and Michelle. They were going to stay just outside of town in a cottage on Sandbridge Beach. As you may know, Virginia Beach is a coastal city in southeastern Virginia. It marks the area where the Chesapeake Bay meets the Atlantic Ocean. With its three-mile boardwalk along the beach-lined oceanfront, it is the perfect tourist destination. Jennifer was really looking forward to the trip because she was supposed to start coaching gymnastics to children at the rec center when she got back. It was supposed to be a fun getaway trip, a last hurrah before she got back to work. And the center was really excited to have Jennifer back. The director told the Atlanta Constitution that children were blessed to be coached by her. 
She touches you immediately, just by her warmth, the director said. After arriving in Virginia Beach on June 17th, Jennifer and her friends spent the evening watching one of Jennifer's favorite movies, The Little Mermaid. She loved Disney movies. Her absolute favorite was The Lion King. The next day, June 18th, Jennifer called her father to wish him a happy Father's Day before she went out for the night with her friends. In Virginia Beach in the 1990s, if you traveled a mile west of the beach, you run into the 19th Street Radisson Hotel. Inside was the Bayou, one of the city's most popular nightclubs. There were two bars, a large stage, a DJ booth, and a dance floor. There were also pool and foosball tables to hang out at. At around 10.30 p.m. on June 18th, Jennifer, Andrea, and Michelle left their beach house and drove about 30 minutes to get to the bayou. When they got there, the kill roos were playing and the dance floor was packed. While inside the nightclub, Jennifer met a tall blonde man who introduced himself as Dusty. He said he was a Navy SEAL, stationed 150 miles northwest of Virginia Beach at Fort A.P. Hill. Dusty explained that he and his swim buddy, Billy Brown, liked to go to the bayou to hang out on the weekends. He didn't mention that he wasn't an official SEAL yet. His graduation was coming up soon. Jennifer and Dusty spent the next hour getting to know each other. Dustin Allen Turner was born in February 1975 to parents Linda and Arch. He has an older brother named Matt. When Dustin, always called Dusty, was 10 months old, Linda and Arch divorced. Dusty stayed with his mother while Arch did remain in his young son's life. Two years later, Linda remarried to a man named Larry. They would go on to have two sons together. As a child, Dusty was in Boy Scouts. He loved camping, hunting, fishing, and other scout activities, and he eventually became an Eagle Scout. He was also a really good student and a jock, participating in almost every team sport at his school. When Dusty was a sophomore, a Navy recruiter went to the high school and talked to students about joining a junior military organization. Pretty much all the men in the Turner family, including Dusty's older brother Matt, were in the military, so joining made sense to him. He was too young to enlist yet, so he did join the junior military organization and went to meetings once a week until he graduated high school. When he was old enough, he enlisted in the Navy. Two weeks after he graduated, he was in boot camp in Orlando, Florida. Then he went to A school, which is for specialized training in Pensacola. Dusty picked photography as his specialty. Then at 18 and a half years old, Dusty applied for the SEAL program and was accepted. There were 115 other recruits, including Billy Joe Brown Jr., who was born in June 1972 to parents Billy Sr. and Patricia. We don't know much about his childhood, but we do know that Billy's dad left when he was young. We also know that in October of 1989, Billy, who was 17 years old, got married. His wife, Dawn, was 14 years old. She had turned 14 the week before. Billy and Dawn had a son, but the marriage didn't last and they were separated by 1995. While married to Don, Billy didn't graduate high school, but he did get his GED in 1991. Before joining the military, he worked in a factory and was going to night school. He was in college for around a year and a half before one of his professors started talking about being in the military. Billy told him he was interested in joining the military, so his professor suggested he should drop out of school and enlist. He enlisted in the Coast Guard. He was only in for a few weeks before he was kicked out for assaulting a superior officer. It was later revealed that this wasn't Brown's first time assaulting someone. On April 12, 1990, 
Billy Brown was charged with assaulting his then 15-year-old wife, Dawn, in front of police officers at their apartment. The Virginian Pilot newspaper reported that the couple had been arguing because Brown accused Dawn of sleeping with four people. Dawn accused him of sleeping with her sister and other women. The argument became physical. After Billy hit Dawn, she ran to another apartment, and he ran after her. When neighbors started watching, Billy started yelling he would shoot them all, though he was unarmed at the time. Police showed up while Billy was trying to get into the apartment where Dawn had fled. Officers told Billy to leave Dawn alone, but he didn't listen. When she opened the door, he grabbed her by the hair and arm and dragged her on the sidewalk toward their apartment while officers tried to stop him. It took at least three officers to subdue the six-foot-two Billy Brown. He was charged with domestic violence, resisting arrest, and other charges. Because he was a juvenile, this record was sealed. This incident was just two months from his 18th birthday. After getting out of the Coast Guard, Brown enlisted in the Navy in February 1993. He was later accepted into the Navy SEAL program. I am assuming because his juvenile record was sealed, he had no trouble enlisting. But I do think it's crazy that he was accepted into the Navy after being kicked out of the Coast Guard, and then he was accepted into the elite SEAL program. Even if his background of domestic violence didn't follow him, you would think assaulting a superior officer would have kept Billy Brown out of the armed forces for good. The documentary, Navy SEAL, Murderer Framed, Target of Opportunity, also questions how Brown made it into the SEAL training program with his violent history. One retired SEAL member said the Navy tries to weed out all of the bad people before they can even start training, but sometimes someone does fall through the cracks. The SEAL program is how Dusty Turner and Billy Brown met. They were in BUDS training together, not in the colloquial sense. BUDS is an acronym for Basic Underwater Demolition SEAL. During training, Dusty was injured. He had a collapsed lung and stress fractures in both legs. Two weeks later, Billy was injured as well. He had a femoral stress fracture. They were in rehab together for a few months before they were able to rejoin another class since their class had already moved on. As part of BUDS, each recruit had a swim buddy. Billy and Dusty were each other's swim buddy. In a Forbes article, SEAL Jeff Boss wrote, No matter where you go in BUDS, you must always have a swim buddy within three feet. Two is one and one is none is the rule which applies for everything. As you can imagine, swim buddies grow very close to each other. The Virginian pilot reported that, quote, the bond between swim buddies is, by design, the tightest among military warriors. In more than three decades of SEAL warfare, no one has left a swim buddy behind. Dead or alive, every SEAL has returned from every mission. Every single one. Not once has a SEAL been captured. Not once has a casualty gone unclaimed. The statistic is the core of the outfit's pride. On December 16, 1994, Turner and Brown graduated from Bud's training. After they completed airborne school, the men got to choose which SEAL team they wanted to join. They both picked Team 4 in Fort A.P. Hill, Virginia. Dusty Turner arrived in Virginia on February 4, 1995. It was three days until his 20th birthday. Supposedly, at that time, he was the youngest SEAL team member in the U.S. Navy. It should be noted that just because Turner and Brown were on a team did not mean they were official Navy SEALs. They were Navy SEAL recruits. They still had to go through SEAL tactical training, a six-month probationary period, which ran concurrently. Turner and Brown were assigned to Echo Platoon, which was part of SEAL Team 4. They started training for a deployment to Panama in August 1995. In order to prepare for their deployment, 
Turner Brown and their STT class were sent to Puerto Rico for advanced dive training. After a month of training, the class went back to Fort A.P. Hill, where they learned advanced small arms, demolition, and field training. Dusty's training did not stop in the classroom either. He spent time getting extra qualifications to be a better asset to his platoon. But Billy, on the other hand, he liked to spend his time drinking. People who knew Billy Brown spoke with Target of Opportunity documentary filmmakers about how he had a tendency to fight and drink. He often showed what they called macho behavior. One Navy SEAL described Brown as being a disaster when he drank. Another said that whenever they went out drinking with Brown, he'd always try to get into some sort of fight. It could be something as small as, that person is looking at me. And Brown did not try to hide his aggression. He once told a roommate that after he caught a guy who was interested in his wife, he started using martial arts on him. He kicked the guy repeatedly. Billy bragged that the guy was begging for him to stop, and eventually stopped begging him and started begging God. The roommate said that Brown was being completely serious when he told this story. While in SEAL training, sometimes the recruits would spend 20 hours a day training, if not longer. So the only time they had for drinking was on the weekends, which meant they would fit a week's worth of drinking into two days. Billy had a goal to drink as much as he possibly could. The peak was when he could drink a pack of beer and a fifth of 151. But Brown didn't just drink on the weekends. He would drink two 40-ounce malt liquor bottles before bed, even if he had to work the next morning. Brown later said he was also smoking pot and taking steroids, which was illegal, of course. On June 18, 1995, Billy Brown spent all day drinking in his room in the barracks. He had six beers and eight to ten shots of Jim Beam. That night, Billy and Dusty decided to go to the bayou. Dusty drove, and on the way there, Billy drank six more beers. They arrived at around 10.30 p.m. At the bayou, Billy had eight to ten beers, eight to ten shots, and twelve mixed drinks. That's on top of what he drank during the day. How was he not even dead from alcohol poisoning? How was he even on his feet? And what kind of bartender overserves like that? As a former bartender, this really pisses me off. It's not just irresponsible, it's dangerous. Soon, Jennifer Evans and her friends, Andrea and Michelle, arrived at the bar and Jennifer struck up a conversation with Dusty. She spent the rest of the night talking to him and her friends. The dance floor was full, the music was loud and Jennifer, Dusty, and her friends were having a good time. Jennifer met Billy in passing, but she didn't talk to him. Andrea and Michelle wanted to leave at around midnight, but Jennifer wanted to keep talking to Dusty. An hour or so later, Jennifer reluctantly said she would go home with her friends. She wrote the phone number to the beach house where she was staying on a napkin and gave it to Dusty. Jennifer's friends walked out to their car, while Jennifer and Dusty followed behind. After the women got in the car, Dusty leaned against the car and kept talking to Jennifer through her open window. He said he could give Jennifer a ride home, but Andrea and Michelle said no. They eventually compromised and said that they would leave Jennifer at the bayou until closing time at 2 a.m., and then they would be back to take her home. She would meet them in the parking lot. Jennifer was happy to spend another hour with Dusty. They went back into the bayou while Andrea and Michelle headed to a diner to get coffee and a snack. At 1.15 a.m., Dusty went up to Billy's ex-girlfriend, Kristen, who worked at the bar, but she wasn't on duty that night. She was just there hanging out with her friends. Dusty asked Kristen if she would give Billy a ride home if he wasn't back by closing to get him. Kristen, very reluctantly, said she would. At 1.35 a.m., Kristen saw Dusty and Jennifer leave the bayou, holding hands. At this time, Billy was still in the bayou, 
He was with Kristen and one of her friends. At 1.45 a.m., Billy said he wanted to leave, but Kristen said she needed to find her other friend first. Billy didn't want to wait, so he left the bayou. At this point, he was said to be noticeably intoxicated and on the verge of losing consciousness. Kristen went after Billy and told him she would wait around for a few minutes to give him a ride home if he couldn't find Dusty. Not long after, Kristen found her friend and went to her car. Kristen and her friend drove around the parking lot looking for Billy, but they didn't see him, so they left. Just before 2 a.m., Andrea and Michelle arrived back at the bayou to pick Jennifer up, but she wasn't in the parking lot. They knew Jennifer always kept her word, so they were immediately alarmed. Andrea and Michelle spent two hours searching for Jennifer, but she just wasn't there. They went back to the beach house, hoping she would be there, but she wasn't. When she was still gone by the morning, Andrea and Michelle called the police to report her missing, but they were told to wait. Andrea told the Atlanta Constitution, because of Jennifer's age, they were kind of under the assumption she had taken off and had just forgotten to call us. The Virginian pilot reported that at this time, more than 2,000 runaways and 400 people a year were reported missing from Virginia Beach, with 98% of them returning. So it's likely the police thought Jennifer had just run off, maybe with a guy, but she would turn up. Andrea and Michelle spent the day searching for Jennifer with no luck, so they went back to the police. After they explained again that Jennifer was not the type of person to disappear, officers started taking them seriously. Andrea and Michelle then had to call Jennifer's parents to tell them the horrible news. Al and Dolores Evans drove all night to Virginia Beach. Once there, they met with police to officially report Jennifer missing. A police lieutenant told the Atlanta Constitution that he then assigned six officers to the case because Jennifer just does not fit the profile of a runaway. Later, he brought in the FBI. Next, the Evans hired a former FBI agent to help them navigate the unthinkable situation they were in. They printed flyers and started calling local TV, radio, and newspaper reporters. Al told the Atlanta Constitution, Obviously, we're hoping to get our daughter back. But he knew something was terribly wrong. Al said, She was never out of touch, even more than a couple of hours, without letting us know what was going on. Other people who knew Jennifer had similar things to say to the media. They knew something was wrong. Many people were worried that Jennifer's disappearance would go on for months, like the disappearance of another Emory student, Shannon Melindy. I covered Shannon's case in episode 137. At this time, Shannon was still missing and had been for 15 months. Her friends and family were desperate to find her. Other relatives and friends of Jennifer's showed up to hand out flyers about her disappearance while authorities reached out to the media and public for help. Community members came together quickly and would even call the Virginia Beach Police Department daily to see if the detectives were okay. Did they need their laundry done? Did they need food? They wanted to do anything they could to help. Two days after Jennifer was last seen, her friends Andrea and Michelle met with a sketch artist to describe the Navy SEAL they had last seen Jennifer with. They didn't remember his name, so a sketch was the best they could do. The Virginian pilot reported that the sketch depicted a square-jawed young man with blonde hair trimmed close to the sides but left thick on top. The sketch was sent off to the media for release the next day. Meanwhile, investigators were following their only solid lead so far. Because Jennifer had last been seen with a Navy SEAL, investigators went to Fort A.P. Hill on June 21st to interview Navy SEALs, including Dusty Turner and Billy Brown. Dusty told investigators that he had been at the bayou with Billy on the 18th. After the bar closed, 
the two men drove back to the barracks alone. They didn't have any women with them. Investigators asked Turner for more information, and Dusty said he had met two women at the bayou, but he couldn't remember their names. One woman was tall, and the other woman was short. She had been there with two friends. Investigators asked Turner about the woman who was there with her two friends, and Dusty said that they had talked for a while, until her friends decided to leave and come back at closing time to get her. Dusty characterized talking to the short girl briefly, as he was still hanging out with his other friends at the bar. The last time he talked to her was at last call. She told him she was in the area for the week and wrote her name and number on a napkin. Dusty said he couldn't remember the girl's name, but he might still have the napkin she wrote her name and number on. Investigators followed him to his room in the barracks, where he found the napkin and handed it over. The name on the napkin was Jennifer. Now that they knew Dusty Turner had met Jennifer, investigators again asked him what happened that night. Turner said that after he met Jennifer at the bar, he thought she might want to leave with him, so he asked Billy Brown's ex-girlfriend Kristen to give Billy a ride home. But Billy didn't want to ride home with Kristen, so Dusty couldn't hang out more with Jennifer, so instead he got her phone number and went back to the barracks with Billy. When investigators asked if Turner and Brown had been drinking at the bayou, Dusty said no, neither one of them drank, which was a stupid lie considering how many witnesses were there that night. Then detectives asked Dusty what he did on Monday, June 19th. He said that he and Billy got up around 9 a.m., signed a new lease on an off-base apartment, and then drove back to base to start their week. By the end of the interview, Investigators believed Dustin Turner's story. He was very calm and collected, and his answers seemed very forthright. They moved on to the next seal. When agents spoke with Billy Brown, he told a similar story, which also seemed believable. So now they were back where they started. Their only lead had been that Jennifer was seen with a Navy seal. That same day, the composite of the man Jennifer was last seen with was released. A $1,000 reward for information was announced, and the Evans added an additional $5,000. Later, the company Jennifer's mother worked for offered a $25,000 reward. On June 22nd, Billy Brown's ex-girlfriend, Kristen, read about Jennifer's disappearance in the newspaper. She saw the police sketch of the man authorities were trying to find. She thought the man looked a lot like Dusty Turner, so she contacted the police and told them what she knew. Turner and Brown had been at the bar that night, and they were both drinking, even though Dusty was underage. And as usual, Billy got way too drunk. Kristen also said she saw Dusty Turner leave with Jennifer, not Billy Brown, at around 1.35 a.m. Investigators went back to talk to Turner and Brown again. Both men offered to take lie detector tests, but detectives said they didn't have to. They believed their stories. Again, they were back at square one. Three days later, on June 25th, there were still no other leads, so detectives met to discuss what they knew. Brown and Turner's stories were similar, but there were a few lies that the investigators were able to pick out. The men said they didn't drink, but Kristen said the guys did drink and that Billy was very obviously drunk. Dusty said he and Billy left together while Jennifer stayed inside, but Kristen said she saw Dusty leave with Jennifer, not Billy, at 1.35 a.m. With no other leads to go on, the investigators decided they needed to speak to Turner and Brown again. On June 27th, Turner and Brown were taken to FBI headquarters in Richmond, Virginia, for more interviews. Their chief warrant officer went with them. The Virginian pilot reported that on the drive, Billy Brown was jovial. He cracked jokes. While Dusty Turner was solemn, he stared out the window. At headquarters, the men were both given polygraph exams. While Billy waited for the exam to be set up, he acted like he wasn't worried at all. He crossed his legs and slumped in the chair. The woman giving the exam later described him as Mr. Cool, which was immediately a red flag to her. 
When she asked questions about if he was involved in Jennifer's disappearance, he said no. All of his answers showed signs of deception, so the examiner asked if she could ask him questions about murder. He said no, and then investigators went back in to talk to him. No matter what tactic they tried, he would not answer their questions. When they left the room, Billy Brown fell asleep. But Dusty Turner also showed signs of deception when he was asked about Jennifer's disappearance so investigators went to speak with him. But unlike Brown, Turner was willing to talk. According to court documents, this time, Dusty Turner said that he and Brown went to the bayou and spent most of the night talking to other Navy SEALs. He said he didn't start talking to Jennifer until around 12 or 12.30 a.m. He introduced himself to Jennifer while she was still talking to her friends, so they only talked for a few minutes. Then he went back to talking to Billy and the other SEALs. At around 1 a.m., Dusty started talking to Jennifer again while her friends were still there. It wasn't long before Jennifer's friends wanted to go home, so Dusty said he walked all three of the women to the car. Jennifer got in the back seat, but didn't close the door, so Dusty told them that they should stay for another hour until the bayou closed. Jennifer said she would stay, and her friends said they would pick her up at closing. As the friends left, Dusty and Jennifer went back inside the bayou. When it came time for last call, Dusty said he asked Jennifer for her number and then talked to her for a few minutes before he went to find Billy so they could leave. He said that he and Billy left at around 1.45 a.m. or 2 a.m. and that Jennifer was not with them. He said the last time he saw her, she was talking to two men he didn't know. After the interview was over, Two different investigators came to interview Dusty Turner. Both later said as the interview went on, Turner's story was changing and his denials became weaker and weaker. They saw that he was close to breaking, so they told him about how they wanted to help Jennifer's family. They wanted to bring home their only child. They said tears welled in Dusty Turner's eyes. He put his head down. Then he said he would tell them what they wanted to know but he wanted to talk to his chief warrant officer, Jeffrey O'Konick. Dusty confessed to O'Konick everything that really happened. When he was finished, O'Konick told him he should answer the questions the detectives had for him honestly. He said, if you do, things will be all right. According to the Virginian pilot, O'Konick had spoken to a Navy lawyer, but the lawyer told him that since the case did not happen on a base, He couldn't help Turner. Detectives choked back disbelief. A massive blunder, they thought. Of course the lawyer could help him. Any lawyer could. So they started questioning him again. After speaking with O'Konick, Dustin Turner said he would take investigators to where Jennifer's body was. They asked him if he killed Jennifer, and he said he did not, but he was there when it happened. According to court documents, This is what Dustin Turner told investigators really happened on June 18th. Dusty and Billy were celebrating their upcoming Navy SEAL graduation at the Bayou. Dusty and Jennifer met, headed off, and spent a few hours together at the club. He thought Jennifer was attractive, nice, and had a bubbly attitude. Because he wanted to spend more time with her, he asked Billy Brown's ex, Kristen, to give him a ride home. But Billy didn't want to get a ride with his ex. He insisted on waiting for Dusty. At around 1.45 a.m., now Monday, June 19th, Dusty and Jennifer went to his car, which was a small, two-door geostorm, to wait for Jennifer's friends to pick her up after they had gone to the diner. Dusty had wanted to take Jennifer to the beach to keep talking, but he realized they couldn't go to the beach and get back to the bayou by 2 a.m. to meet Jennifer's friends. So instead, They went to Dusty's car to just talk until the friends arrived. While they were in his car, he watched as Billy approached. Dusty said he told Jennifer to pay no attention to this guy. He's drunk. Don't believe a word he says. He let Billy Brown get in the backseat of the car on the passenger side, and then Billy immediately started cursing and making belligerent remarks about Dusty and his ex-girlfriend Kristen. Dusty told investigators he thought Billy was mad at him that night 
for hanging out with Jennifer instead of him. He also thought Billy was mad that he tried to find him another ride home. Dusty said he couldn't remember everything from that night since he had been drinking, but he did remember Billy started cursing at Jennifer while they were in the car. Billy Brown then asked Jennifer if she was a virgin and if she had ever had sex with a frogman. Dusty could tell that Jennifer was uncomfortable, so he told Billy to chill out. Dustin Turner then said he watched as Billy Brown touched Jennifer, and she slapped his hand away. Then he saw Billy, quote, reach around and make a jerking motion with both arms. Billy had his arms locked around Jennifer's neck and was squeezing. Dusty said he tried to get Billy off of Jennifer, but he couldn't. He said Jennifer's arms were straight to her sides. She never moved her hands up. After around a minute, Billy relaxed his arms, and Dusty checked to see if Jennifer was breathing. But she was dead. He said that Billy then yelled at him to drive, and Dusty did what he was told. As a side note, I had a really hard time with this part of the story. Haley even sent me a video of her boyfriend demonstrating, and I also asked my husband, because I just could not understand how a Navy SEAL was unable to stop an extremely drunk man from killing Jennifer, even if that drunk man was a SEAL too. I googled an image for a geostorm, the small car Dusty drove, and it is really small. There were only two doors. So Dusty and Jennifer had to willingly let Billy in the back seat because he was riding home with Dusty. But then he grabbed her behind in a basic chokehold. It was an extremely tight space. I researched some statistics about chokeholds, and Jennifer would have been incapacitated in seconds. Usually, it then takes minutes of manual strangulation for a victim to die. But every person is different. Dusty said it took about a minute for Jennifer. He said he couldn't pull Billy's arms off of Jennifer, and once I could picture it, it made sense. He didn't have the force of his weight like he would have if he was facing Jennifer and Billy. He was pulling from the side and could not pull Billy off without that force. Okay, I'm going back to our timeline, but I wanted to stop and explain to you in case you had a hard time picturing what happened like I did. As Dusty drove away, Billy reclined the passenger seat where Jennifer's body still lay and reached under her shorts until Dusty yelled at him to stop. Then Billy passed out in the back of the car. Dusty drove until he found a place to dump Jennifer's body, and Billy woke up to help get her out of the car. Dusty said he went back to the car to try and find a shovel, and when he went back, he found Billy on top of Jennifer's body. He said he pulled Billy off of Jennifer, and Billy said, quote, It doesn't matter, because I couldn't get a heart on anyway. They covered Jennifer's body with sticks and leaves, and then got back in the car. Billy passed out again on the drive, but then woke up and said he was hungry, so Dusty stopped. After Billy ate, they went back to the base. All of this sounds crazy to me, but I think one thing is for sure. Billy was a mean drunk, and he was a bully. Dusty was used to it and thought he could handle him. He probably never dreamed that Billy would do something like that. After Jennifer was dead, Dusty Turner seemed to just go into a frozen haze. He did everything Billy told him to. In the morning, they even signed a lease together for an off-base apartment. When they were done, Dusty said Billy told him, quote, I know what I did was stupid and I'm sorry. I know it was stupid, but we've got to stick together now. We're both in this now. We've got to stick together. Dustin Turner told investigators that he lied because he felt like he had gone too far and couldn't turn back. Before the interview was over, he drew a map to where investigators could find Jennifer. She was in Newport News Park, which is around 50 miles north of the bayou, on the way to Fort A.P. Hill. After speaking with Dustin Turner, investigators went to Billy Brown and told him that Turner confessed and drew a map leading them to Jennifer's body. 
Billy asked investigators what Dusty had told them, but they refused to tell him anything. So Billy then said he would tell them what happened. He claimed he walked out of the bayou, he found Dusty's car, and inside Jennifer was passed out in the back seat. He said that Dusty Turner had choked her out. He said together they drove down a side street, parked, and then started undressing and touching Jennifer. Billy claimed at that moment she woke up screaming, so Dusty started choking her. Quote, she stopped moving and we let go of her. She started spitting up some blood and he started choking her again. I grabbed her arms and legs. When they realized Jennifer was dead, they panicked and drove away. Billy admitted to investigators that while Dusty drove, he fondled Jennifer. He added, I guess that's pretty sick. Billy also told how he fell asleep and when he woke up, they took Jennifer's body into the woods and covered her with leaves and twigs. They later went to get breakfast because he was hungry. He noted to investigators that Dusty did not eat. An hour after this confession, Billy Brown told investigators he lied and would now like to tell them the truth, a new truth. This time, Billy added more detail. He said Dusty spent the whole night talking to Jennifer. At one point, Dusty told him he was going to hook up with Jennifer and had asked Kristen to give him a ride home. Billy said he didn't want Kristen to drive him home because he was afraid he would have sex with her and that would ruin the current relationship he was in. He said later, when he left the bayou, he went up to Dusty's car and saw two heads in the back before Dusty jumped out and demanded that Billy get in the car. He is now making it sound like Dusty was the bully. Billy claimed that when he got in the car, he saw Jennifer lying in the back seat with blood coming out of her nose and foam coming out of her mouth. Her clothes were open and Jennifer's breasts were showing. He then claimed that Dusty told him, quote, I think I fucking killed her. Billy said he got in the car and Dusty pulled Jennifer's body down to the floorboards. After they started driving, he claimed Dusty said, I know what we'll do. We'll take her to the beach. We'll rape her, throw her in the water, and the cops will think she drowned. Billy said he was in and out of consciousness during the drive, but he does remember Dusty driving on the 64 freeway, then pulling off into a wooded area to dump Jennifer's body. Billy said that two days later, Dusty told him that he had been trying to have sex with Jennifer in the parking lot, but when she tried to stop him, Dusty, quote, put his forearm on her throat and pushed back. The next thing he knew, she started spitting up blood and foam. It should be noted here that the investigators never tried to corroborate what Billy Brown said happened. Terry DeGelder, a seasoned homicide detective who had worked on the John Wayne Gacy case, later watched videos of investigators interrogating Billy Brown. DeGelder said he kept waiting for them to try to get Billy to tell them the truth, but instead, they just said, okay, and accepted the last story Billy gave them. The documentary, Navy SEAL Murderer Framed Target of Opportunity, pointed out that Billy drew a picture of what Jennifer looked like in the car. It was a stick figure drawing. The investigators never tried to recreate that drawing in an actual geostorm. If they did, they would see that what Billy said happened and drew was physically impossible. For one thing, there was no way Jennifer could have been pulled down to the floorboard of a geo storm. According to court documents, Dustin Turner's car was later searched for semen, fingerprints, etc., but there was nothing of forensic value. There was no sign of any sexual activity in the car or evidence of Jennifer even being in the back seat of the car. Perhaps most importantly, Jennifer's blood was not in the car. That was a big point in Billy's story. After the interviews, investigators took Dustin Turner to go find Jennifer's body. He led them to a spot around 50 feet off of a bike path. There, under leaves and sticks, was 21-year-old Jennifer Evans. Court documents stated that when her body was recovered, Jennifer was in an advanced state of decomposition and skeletonization, such that many of her bones were exposed. 
This was June 27th, nine days after Jennifer was murdered. But the punishing Virginia heat had sped up decomposition. The vest Jennifer had been wearing that night she was killed was pulled back and her bra was pushed up, exposing her breasts. Her shorts and underwear were pulled down and were only around one leg. The coroner who conducted Jennifer's autopsy found that it was not possible to determine an exact cause of death due to the decomposition. While Jennifer's neck was not broken, manual strangulation was still a possibility. Following the grim discovery, Jennifer's parents spoke with the media, telling them, quote, You can't imagine how empty our lives are, how hard it is to be without her. So much of our lives were tied up in and tied together by her life. I would hope that she would be remembered for her compassion, for her love of life. 23-year-old Billy Brown and 20-year-old Dustin Turner were arrested and charged with murder, abduction, and intent to defile with an animate object, meaning Billy's hand. Billy Brown was also charged with attempted rape. When news of Dusty Turner's arrest was made public, many people were absolutely shocked. The SEALs who were on the team with Brown and Turner all thought that Billy was the one who killed Jennifer, and Dusty was somehow caught up in it. The Virginian pilot reported that a few days after Turner's arrest, prosecutors from the Commonwealth's Attorney's Office began reviewing the case. Because of a lack of evidence against Dustin Turner, they wanted to downgrade his charges to a misdemeanor of accessory after the fact. But the investigators on the case said no. They believed he was equally responsible for what happened. If a jury acquitted him, then that would be okay, but they did not want to lower his charges. I'm not sure why investigators would get the final say in this. It should have been the Commonwealth's decision. But that's not what happened. Dusty went on trial for everything Billy did except the attempted rape charge. Brown and Turner's trials were separated. Opening statements for Billy Brown's trial began on May 24, 1996. The prosecution's case was that Billy Brown joined in killing Jennifer because he was mad that his ex-girlfriend Kristen had rejected him at the bayou. Their theory was that Jennifer passed out in Dustin Turner's car, then woke up to both Brown and Turner undressing her. She screamed and fought back while Dusty strangled her and Billy held her down. The defense's case was that Dustin Turner was the one who killed Jennifer. Billy went to Dusty's car in the parking lot and found Jennifer dead. The defense insisted the only thing Billy did was help dispose of Jennifer's body. Billy testified at his trial on his own behalf. He told the jury what he had told investigators in his final version of events. But the jury did not believe him. On June 5, 1996, almost a year to the date of Jennifer's murder, Billy Brown was found guilty on all charges. He was sentenced to 42 years for murder, 25 years for abduction with intent to defile, and 5 years for attempted rape. The sentences were to be served consecutively, 67 years. Brown's later appeals were all denied. It is interesting to note that in a 1998 appeal document, it is stated that Brown killed Jennifer, then he and Turner got rid of her body. Dustin Turner's trial began on August 26, 1996. The prosecution's case was that Turner and Brown planned to have a threesome with Jennifer. When she didn't want to participate, she was abducted in Turner's car and then killed somewhere else. She was not killed in the parking lot. Because Jennifer was killed in the act of an abduction, that meant Turner and Brown committed first-degree murder. The prosecution hit hard on the abduction part because if they could not prove abduction, then they didn't have the underlying factor needed for first-degree murder. To help bolster the threesome theory, the prosecution had a few people testify that Turner and Brown were known for engaging in group sexual encounters. One Navy SEAL, a guy named Todd, testified that on June 16, 1995, he saw Turner and Brown talking to two women. Todd said that Dusty Turner would alternate talking to one of the young women and then talking to Billy to give him a progress report. 
the two women did not go home with Brown and Turner. Todd also said that while he was stationed with Turner and Brown in California, he saw Brown and Turner engage in group sexual intercourse with a woman. Another SEAL, Julio, testified that he had been at the bayou on June 18th. Just after last call, he asked Turner and Brown what their plans were for the night. He testified that Dusty Turner told Julio that he and Brown were going to have a threesome with Jennifer. Just then, Jennifer walked up and introduced herself to Julio, who then gave Brown and Turner a thumbs up. He claimed Dustin Turner smiled at him. The defense's case was that Dusty Turner did not commit murder or abduction. At the most, he was an accessory after the fact. Their main defense was Dusty's own testimony. When asked about engaging in group sexual encounters, Turner said that Todd's testimony was based on one time in California, but it was not something Turner and Brown did often. He also said that he never told Julio that he wanted to have a threesome with Jennifer. Dustin Turner testified that he had no intention of sleeping with Jennifer. He said that he did not actively try to sleep with her because she wasn't that type of girl at all. On the stand, Dusty recited the same story he told investigators in his last interview. He added that he couldn't leave Billy after he killed Jennifer. As a SEAL, he was trained to protect his swim buddy and never leave his side. He said his head was swimming at the time and he wasn't thinking rationally. It didn't seem like he had time to think, so he just started driving. Billy Brown did not testify at Dusty's trial. But the jury did not believe Dusty's story. On September 5, 1996, Dustin Turner was found guilty of abduction with intent to defile and the murder of Jennifer Evans. The jury foreman later said that most of the jury members did not think Dusty had anything to do with Jennifer's murder, but he helped cover it up so they didn't want him to walk out a free man. Dustin Turner was sentenced to 37 years for abduction with intent to defile and 45 years for murder. The sentences would run consecutively, so 82 years. He got 15 more years than Billy Brown, who was also convicted of attempted rape. His appeals to the Court of Appeals and to the Supreme Court of Virginia were both denied. In June 1997, Jennifer's parents, Al and Dolores, filed a wrongful death lawsuit against Turner, Brown, and the United States government. They sought $5 million in compensatory damages and $10 million in punitive damages from Turner and Brown. Jennifer's parents sued the United States government because Turner and Brown were part of the Navy SEAL team. Their attorneys argued that without their SEAL training, Turner and Brown would not have raped and killed Jennifer. They said the SEAL program turns trainees into lethal weapons and instills a sense of invincibility as well as euphoria, implying that he can do no wrong. Also, the government should never have let Brown join the Navy based on his violent history. They were negligent when they allowed him to enlist. By training Billy Brown, a man with a violent history, to be a SEAL, the government created not merely a lethal weapon, but a highly volatile lethal weapon, which should not have been released in public. The lawsuit also said that because some SEAL team members knew about Turner and Brown's group sex tendencies, the government knew or should have known about them as well. They should have known that Brown and Turner were unfit for SEAL training. The lawsuit was later dismissed. You already know that I completely agree that Billy Brown was not fit to serve. But I don't think Dustin Brown's consensual sex life should have kept him out of service. That's totally different. But I definitely understand why Jennifer's family feels this way. Dusty did not have a violent history, but Jennifer's parents considered him just as bad as Billy. And I cannot say that I blame them. Why would they believe him? In March 1999, Billy Brown, like so many other convicts on the inside, became a Christian. He then told his attorney and his mom the truth of what happened to Jennifer. On the night of June 18, 1995, 
Billy said he didn't want to have sex, so he purposefully drank a lot. Kristen was supposed to give him a ride home so Dusty could spend more time with Jennifer, but Kristen was also waiting to take her friend home, and Billy didn't want to wait. He said he was about to pass out, so he found Dusty's car and got in the back seat. Jennifer and Dusty were already in the car. Billy remembered saying vulgar things to Jennifer, but couldn't remember the specifics. Billy said, quote, One moment, I was normal, and the next minute, I snapped, and I started choking her. He said he choked Jennifer by putting his left arm against her neck and holding it with his right arm. In one story, Billy said he killed Jennifer instantly with one choke. In another, he said he thought he killed Jennifer with one choke, but she regained consciousness, so he had to choke her again until blood came out of her nose. Billy said he was pretty sure he remembered Dusty Turner trying to pry his arms off of Jennifer. Billy said when he realized Jennifer was dead, he told Dusty to drive. Billy admitted to removing Jennifer's vest, pulling her pants down, and attempting to have sex with her corpse before Dusty came back to help cover up Jennifer's body. According to court documents, in May 2002, Dustin Turner was transferred to a new prison. A few days after his arrival, another inmate told Dusty that Billy Brown had confessed. Dusty called his mom, Linda, and they talked about what to do. Linda called an attorney who was familiar with Turner and Brown's case. The attorney went to visit Billy in prison and brought an audio recorder. Billy Brown made a full confession as to what happened that night on tape. Billy admitted to lying to investigators about Dusty's involvement in Jennifer's death. He also said he lied on the stand at his own trial. He was the one who choked Jennifer and blamed Dusty because Dusty betrayed him by confessing to investigators and leading them to Jennifer's body. Billy said his mindset was, he snitched, screw him. He later signed an affidavit saying what he said in the recorded interview was true. After Brown signed the affidavit, Dustin Turner filed a petition for a writ of actual innocence based on newly discovered non-biological evidence. Virginia filed a motion to dismiss Turner's petition, saying that Brown's confession wasn't credible, and even if it was, there was other evidence to prove Turner was guilty. The Court of Appeals denied Virginia's motion to dismiss and remanded Turner's writ of actual innocence to the circuit court. In May 2008, the circuit court had an evidentiary hearing where Billy Brown officially testified to what he wrote in the affidavit. A month later, the circuit court ruled that Brown, quote, is credible in his assertion that he acted independently in murdering the victim and that Turner had no role in the murder or in the restraining of the victim. It was also ruled that the evidence presented in the trials of both Turner and Brown was largely, if not completely, circumstantial. Without their testimony, there were no other witnesses to the incident, and there was no scientific or forensic evidence. Basically, without Billy Brown's testimony, there was nothing tying Dusty Turner to Jennifer's murder. The Court of Appeals went over the circuit court's findings and granted Turner's request for a writ of actual innocence. His convictions were overturned, and it was ruled that the most he could be found guilty of was being an accessory after the fact. In Virginia, accessory after the fact is a misdemeanor and is punishable by a maximum of 12 months in jail. The case was then sent back to the circuit court to modify Turner's convictions. After finding out that Turner's convictions were overturned, Jennifer's parents, Al and Dolores, were very upset. They were convinced that Dustin Turner was guilty of the charges he was convicted of. Dolores told the media, Jennifer is the real victim here. It's been almost 14 years since I last heard her voice, was cheered by her laughter, or got a warm hug from her. Virginia petitioned the Court of Appeals for a rehearing in front of the judges. On June 29, 2010, after the rehearing, the Court of Appeals dismissed Dustin Turner's petition for a writ of actual innocence. 
the court ruled that, quote, while it was bound by the circuit court's credibility determination, a rational fact finder could have found that Turner abducted Jennifer by deception, meaning no finding of force or restraint would have been required, and that the abduction ended with Jennifer's murder. The evidence supporting deception included Turner asking Kristen to give Brown a ride home and Turner telling Julio he was going to have a threesome with Jennifer. But if you think about that, those two things contradict each other. The Court of Appeals argued that if Brown hadn't killed Jennifer in the car, Turner still would have abducted her and raped her. Turner appealed the Court of Appeals ruling to the Supreme Court of Virginia, who ruled that the Court of Appeals did not err in dismissing Dustin Turner's petition for writ of actual innocence, and the court's judgment was affirmed. Dusty Turner's writ of actual innocence was his last chance to be released on appeal. Once it was denied, he no longer had any other options. The only way Turner can be released is if the governor grants him clemency. In February of 2014, Billy sent Dusty a letter. According to Dusty, the letter was about Billy's, quote, perspective on how he took Jennifer's life and why he felt it necessary to blame me for the crime. Billy wrote, I figured the state would want to accuse two instead of one, and I figured if I was going down, I would take you with me. Billy also asked Dusty to forgive him, not for his sake, but for Dusty's sake. But Dusty certainly was not looking to forgive Billy. He said that, quote, because of the effects and continuing impact of his deeds on so many innocent people, especially upon my family, I don't know when or if I shall ever forgive him. Today, Billy Brown is incarcerated in Buckingham Correctional Center in Dillwyn, Virginia. His release date is set for July 3, 2058, when he will be 85 years old. According to FreeDusty.org, Dustin Turner has accomplished many things in the various prisons he's been incarcerated in. He implemented a dog training program at Green Rock. The prison worked with bandit adoption and rescue of canines. Turner also started an offender rehabilitation program called Mending Fences. In 2016, he finished a victim advocacy certificate course from Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University. He also completed a four-month-long Victim Impact Listen and Learn program. Turner's education transcript shows he was rated excellent. These days, Dusty Turner spends time writing short articles, which are shared on social media, as well as reading and working out. He has played on prison basketball teams, as well as served as a referee for Prison Volleyball League. He is now incarcerated in Greensville Correctional Center in Jarrett, Virginia. His release date is set for January 17, 2067, when he's almost 92 years old. I am already certain I will get emails and reviews saying I am too sympathetic to Dustin Turner. I swear I'm not complaining, I'm just stating a fact. But before you jump on me, I have to tell you, I had a lot of trouble with this case myself. I went back and forth with Haley, trying to understand how the murder happened. I bounced questions off my husband for hours. It's been a long time since I have felt this conflicted about how someone was killed. But in the end, I do believe Dusty Turner's story. He was the only one to confess, and forensics backed up his confession. Billy Brown lied until he found God, until it was too late to help the man who was once his friend. What Dusty did was wrong. That is indisputable. But he did not kill Jennifer. He did not rape Jennifer. He did not kidnap Jennifer. He liked her. He liked talking to her. He got her phone number. The napkin Jennifer gave him also helps prove his story. And she liked him too. I think he witnessed his brutal, drunk friend kill Jennifer very quickly in a chokehold, and then he panicked. He was there when it happened. He had been talking to her all night. He knew how it would look. It did take him nine days to do the right thing, but he did do it. He did confess. 
and he did it without the protection of an attorney. The penalty for what he actually did is 12 months, one year. And he is going to serve basically for the rest of his life. And maybe that's okay with you. Maybe you are one of these lock them up and throw away the key types. I get that. I really do. If you have listened to my show long enough, you have heard it in my voice. You have heard me call killers monsters. I believe the monster here is Billy Brown. He disgusts me. He didn't just kill Jennifer. He let his friend rot in prison for the rest of his life for something he did. Dusty was there when Billy Brown took Jennifer Evans out of this world, away from her loved ones. Billy stole her future. He also stole Dusty's. Maybe look at it this way. I am not a legislator, and I certainly don't determine the statutes for how much time in prison certain crimes should merit. But think about it. What if someone who is an accessory after the fact knows they would get the same punishment as the actual killer? What is the motivation for them coming forward and doing the right thing? And to say because it's the right thing to do is not enough when you are talking about the rest of someone's life. Dusty clearly felt remorse for his part and probably wished he had never met Billy Brown. And he wasn't even sure yet what the penalty would be when he did do the right thing. What if he hadn't told the truth? How long would Jennifer's family have had to wait? What if she had never been found? The agony of not laying your child to rest is unfathomable. It's why missing persons cases are so terribly haunting. After a while, the assumption is they were murdered, but their families struggle to find peace when they don't get this final act of love, the funeral. It doesn't matter if you are religious or not. Funerals are a way of saying goodbye. They are comforting to family and friends. For families who choose to bury their children, it is a sacred place to visit. Imagine not ever having that chance because someone knew he could get life in prison instead of one year in prison for telling the truth. Jennifer Evans and Shannon Melindy went missing within 15 months of each other. It took 10 years for Shannon's family to get the truth. But they never got their daughter's remains. They could never give her a proper burial. I still struggle with Dusty's part in all of this. In my mind, I would have jumped out of the car screaming, called the police, done anything to try and stop her murder. I asked Mike, my husband, as a man, what he would have done. His first instinct was that he would have started punching Billy if he couldn't break his arms out of the chokehold and probably jump out of the car like I said too. I think the difference is, if we believe Dusty, Jennifer died very quickly. In one minute, he said. He told the truth about everything else. The forensic evidence, or lack thereof, meaning no blood, semen, or anything else was found in his car, supports his story. So he decided he was already a part of her murder. It was too late. Personally, I would have driven to the police station once Billy passed out or to the nearest phone to call the police. I think that would have kept Dusty Turner out of prison for the rest of his life. But my husband and I are not Navy SEALs, nor have we ever served. So I realize that I will never understand the bond between two Navy SEALs or between any servicemen or women. I thought about giving you some quotes showing how Dusty's mind went back to his training to stick with Billy. But I don't think that matters to us lay people. We can't understand it. What we do understand is that Dusty was there when a girl died. He couldn't stop it, but he didn't do the right thing after that either. It took nine days to tell the truth. And to be clear, I am glad that he did. I am very glad Jennifer's family was able to bury their daughter and knew the truth about that night. I think the lesson here is that despite the typical punishment for an accessory after the fact, the truth is, your life is in the hands of a jury and then different judges. 
Some judges felt Dusty should have been released. Others didn't. And I am willing to bet many of you feel conflicted about it, too. If only Dusty had gone straight to the police, he would not be in prison right now. But I really don't think he believed that. He thought he was going to prison along with Billy. And personally, I think we should follow the law. I don't believe Dusty deserves a life sentence. He has already served 27 years. His next clemency petition can be submitted in 2024. His next parole hearing is in 2023. Only time will tell what the wills of justice will do to Dusty Turner. And no matter how you feel about Dusty's part in this or how long he has served, the final thought I want to leave you with is Jennifer Leah Evans. She would be 48 years old. She would be a pediatrician. Maybe she would have been a mother. She was an only child, so her parents lost everything. Their beautiful daughter. Grandchildren. Emory University gives away an annual Jennifer Leah Evans Award to a rising senior who has exhibited passion for caring for sick, injured, or disabled children and who has demonstrated throughout his or her high school and college years a love and capacity for working with children. The world lost a really special person that awful June night. Jennifer's life was snuffed out in about a minute. A drunken jerk, who was actually a trained killer, squeezed the life out of Jennifer so quickly and so easily. We can only hope and pray that she blacked out within seconds and did not suffer, that she didn't realize she was going to die. It's a sickening feeling that it can happen that quickly, that a lovely, vibrant young woman can be just snatched from our world in one minute. Southern Fried True Crime is hosted and produced by me, Erica Kelly. Today's episode was researched by Haley Gray and written by me and Haley. Southern Fry's original music is by Rob Harrison of Gamma Radio, and the original graphic art is by Coley Horner. If you have any case suggestions, please visit my website, southernfriedtruecrime.com, and go to the Listener Suggestion tab. This is the best way for me to get those little-known cases you'll always send me. Please remember that I do not accept suggestions on social media private messages. With three platforms to manage, that is very overwhelming for me. I hope you understand. But please come join our Facebook group, Southern Fried True Crime Fans Discussion Group, where we swap recipes, worship Dolly Parton, and share memes. I much prefer spending my social media time in our lovely group. We do, of course, discuss true crime, not just Southern Fraud, but all kinds. But it is still very much a Southern lifestyle group. We'd love to have you. Our group is a safe and fun corner of Facebook, and by God, we mean it when we say no shit ass is allowed. It's not just a motto, it is how we run the group. If you enjoyed today's show, don't forget to subscribe and please tell a friend or rate and review on iTunes. I'm also on all large platforms like iHeart, Stitcher, and Spotify. Until next time, thanks so much for listening. Y'all take care.